Welcome back here on Live Now from Fox. And I do want to get back to some breaking news out of the Middle East right now. Israel saying that troops have recovered the body of a hostage murdered in captivity by Islamic Jihad. The IDF identifying the hostage killed as 47-year-old Elad Katzer. He is from Kibbutz Nur Oz, and his body was retrieved, we're told, by Israeli troops in Gaza's Han Yunus. Katzer and his mother were kidnapped back on October 7th when Hamas did attack Israel, and his father was murdered at that time. Katzer's mother released from captivity in November. There have been a lot of developments out of the Middle East over the last 24 hours, and I do want to bring in a friend of the show here, Mark Chandler, Director of Government Relations at Coastal Carolina University and a professor of practice, also a former senior defense intelligence official. As always, Mark, thank you so much for joining us here to help break all of this down. You're welcome, Josh, and good morning. Good morning. Now, first off, how significant is it to uh, the IDF to be able to recover the body of yet another hostage, but also learn a little bit more information about what happened to him, as there are still more than 100 hostages held since October 7th? Well, Josh, I think it's very significant. And, and here's what's happened. Obviously, hostage recovery remains at the top of the Israeli requirements and their priorities. So it does show they are continuing to gather look for intelligence on the location of those hostage. I mean, it's unfortunate uh, that, that he was dead, that he was killed by uh, the terrorist group. Now, he was held by Islamic Jihad, which is one, the lesser known of the two terrorist groups between Hamas and Islamic Jihad that have been fighting Israel since October 7th. The fact that they were able to find out where he was held and then go try to get him, obviously too late, that, that's significant. As I said, it shows that priority. Unfortunately, there's 134 hostages still held, and it, it's estimated that 30 plus of those are dead. So th they're gonna continue these operations. Khan Yunus was one of the big Hamas and Islamic Jihad strongholds that Israel's still trying to clean up through military operations. Hopefully we'll see more of these successful to recover some live hostages. And I do want to talk a little bit about Islamic Jihad, because uh, like you said, little known, you don't hear as much about them. You hear more about Hamas and the battle between Israel and Hamas. So what do we know about Islamic Jihad overall? Well, when you when you look at kind of the structure in there, they're independent, but they're not from Hamas. So that the October 7th attacks were carried out by members of Hamas and Islamic Jihad. The largest fighting organization that Hamas has is called the Qassam Brigades. And so that's where the 30 plus thousand fighters have come from. And Islamic Jihad has a hardcore element numbering in, in fewer thousands, but they operate sometimes independently conducting some operations. If we go back to the Al Shifa hospital bombing incident that was initially blamed on Israel, those were Islamic Jihad rockets that were launched. So they're, they're working in coordination with Hamas. Uh, they have some independence. They've attacked Israel independently from Hamas over the decades. So you're gonna continue to see this and the hostages they have, that makes it a little bit more difficult to include them to try to find out where they are and to withdraw those hostages. I also wanna talk about the threats from Iran as it relates to Israel. We talked just days ago about the uh, strike there over on the uh, Iranian embassy there over in uh, Syria. So as far as what Iran is threatening right now, how seriously does Israel take it? But at the same time, we know that the US has essentially said they're on high alert. Yeah, I think it's very significant. So, so we're past the initial window of, of what I estimated that the Iranian response might, might take. And so when we're looking at this, I think Iran still has several options. They can do a direct attack. They can use their proxies such as Hezbollah and some of those Iranian-backed Shia militia in Syria and Iraq. They, they can also go after, uh, use the Houthis as a, as a coordinated attack. Additionally, I think U.S. forces are open, even though there's been back-channel communication between the U.S. and Iran to tell Iran not to strike U.S. forces, but they're still a viable target in the region. It is significant that the U.S. came out and said that they're on high alert. Uh, they're talking with Israel about the intelligence they have. They're not releasing where they're getting it, but I think we're creeping closer 
to that Iranian response. There, there was a little known cyber incidents against the foreign ministry uh, yesterday in Israel, I believe. That is also an option that Iran has to do a barrage cyber attack, if you will. But I think we're going to see more of a kinetic attack. And I think with that warning that the U.S. put out in coordination with Israel is that we're, we're in the next few days. Ramadan ends this week. So Iran could actually be waiting. They did not wait this long after we killed Qasem Soleimani in 2020. But I think what we're seeing here is some detailed planning that's likely going to take the form of using the proxies and not a direct attack from Iran. That attack would seriously escalate the situation because Israel would not stand for a direct attack from Iran. And this, Josh, I apologize, just I know for interrupting, but this could also take place outside of the region. Israel evacuated several of its embassies in the region, but Iran has been known to counterattack outside of the region in a response to something like this. So it's it's actually tenuous wherever you are. I want to talk a little bit more about <laughs> ceasefire deal because you and I have been discussing this now for several months as Israel and Hamas have been going kind of back and forth here. It sounds as though Hamas within the last maybe 24 hours has again rejected a deal. Where does everything stand as far as uh, you know at this point? Well, I, unfor <clears throat> excuse me. unfortunately, Josh, I think Hamas is in the driver's seat on this. Uh, they, they felt comfortable enough to deny this latest proposal, and you have Qatar, Egypt, the United States, and Israeli personnel trying to negotiate this ceasefire to at least start with six weeks hostage exchange for Palestinian prisoners and humanitarian aid, increased humanitarian aid flow. Hamas... I think because of some statements that the U.S. made this week in, in response to that tragic accident on the World Kitchen, I think what they're doing is they're feeling emboldened enough to say, we can back off, we have the hostages, we have world public opinion on our side, so therefore they have time on their side. The negotiators are supposed to go back into Cairo today to start talking. Israel's debating whether or not they're going to send them. So right now, the the entire ceasefire negotiation process is in jeopardy. And we do know that we uh, learned just yesterday from that IDF investigation into the World Central Kitchen incident that uh, two of the officers there had been let go or fired as a result. Others were reprimanded. What do you make of that report? What stood out to you? And also the fact that there's been calls for an independent investigation. Is that likely to even happen? Is it even possible? Well, well, first off, Josh, let me say that I, I'm sorry for the loss of life here. I'm sorry to those families who, whose uh, families were killed in that attack. However, let, let me put this in a little bit of context. First off, this is, this is what we call the fog of war. This was a nighttime strike, strike, and when you start to look at this, it's very hard to identify moving vehicles at night. Now, to Israel's credit, they came out almost immediately and admitted fault. And so they admitted the accident in the fog of war in a nighttime urban environment, very difficult environment. And then I think within 48 hours of that is when they relieved these two senior officers. They, they have reprimanded other officials involved in this entire intelligence planning and strike. So that's significant and I think shows Israel taking ownership of this. For context, if we go back to the debacle that was the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan in 2021, we conducted a, a similar strike and we killed 10 people in that strike. Uh, we killed a, a, a gentleman and his family in that strike. We denied that that was any kind of humanitarian operation that we struck at that time. Matter of fact, the United States denied it for several days. We asserted that it was a good strike, it was a terrorist strike. Only after several weeks of review did the U.S. come out and say, yes, we made a mistake, it was a strike. And then there were some internal decisions made on that process. So I'm careful to point fingers here, uh, especially if I were the United States, I'd be careful considering this is not the last we're gonna see. Any modernized war fighting country is going to have these type of mistakes 
in the fog of war. I don't like to say that, but that's just a, the nature of warfare and the confusion that takes place when you have seconds or minutes to make a decision. But Israel owned up to this. Now, as for your question about allowing uh, an independent survey or independent review, no. Uh, I don't know of any military that would allow outsiders to come in and review their process because what happens is you would reveal your intelligence sources, you would reveal how you conduct targeting. That then opens it up for our adversaries to understand how to deceive us or actually draw us into something like this. So I think an independent investigation is out. I think Israel has done what it should. They're continuing to investigate. I think that, unfortunately, this, this happens in war, and I think this just needs to move on. I would be careful about any kind of indignation that we're showing when we're guilty of the same thing. My last question for you here, there's been a lot of back and forth, a lot of criticism from President Biden and his administration against Netanyahu and the situation in Gaza right now. Would the U.S., based on what you've seen, ever actually withdraw support from Israel? And a second part to that question, I've been asking a lot of loaded questions here, but can Israel win its war against Hamas and defeat Hamas without help from the U.S.? Well, the first part of your question, Josh, <clears throat> I have to look at it this way. Six months ago, uh, just about when this war started, we came out in 100% staunch support behind Israel and what it needed to do for this to strike back at Hamas and that terror attack. Today, I don't know, and, and, and I hate to be in that situation, but to predict what this administration is going to do going forward, I, I just don't know if they're gonna maintain that support. Yesterday, walking to the helicopter, President Biden said, yes, you know, we're not gonna abandon Israel. I, I put this in context. Israel has been a staunch ally for us for 80 years. And when I look at that, there, there's a, a key situation where we look at the Middle East. So you're asking, you know, would we withdraw support? I would ask, could we afford to withdraw support from Israel during this time? They have helped us in two major wars, the Desert Shield, Desert Storm War, and the Operation Iraqi Freedom Invasion. So when you look at the support that we have of the only democratic country in there, this would be like cutting your nose off to spite your face in a short-term vision. I, I like to take the strategic approach uh, to foreign relations, to national security, and, and whether you like it or not, we need Israel in the Middle East. We need that support, and we use them, and they need us. So the relationship has to stand through this despite any political reasoning behind making these statements or domestic politics that are involved in an election year. We have to be careful of making a short-sighted decision. Now, can Israel survive without our support? Can they conduct this war without it? Yes, they can. But what, what's going to happen is you're going to see more death, more destruction, because once we stop supplying, if we did, for instance, our precision munition guided kits, that means Israel's going to have to use more broad bombing, if you will, not accurate bombing. And they have really tightened up their operations. But without that, this war is going to drag out and be more deadly and more destructive without the U.S. support. So all of those who are talking about pulling the military support should take a step back and look at what the results will be. It won't be peace. It'll actually be more destruction and death that would emanate, that would result from this. All right, Mark, as always, a great conversation. I love that you're able to help kind of break down all of these different developments. There are so many that happen pretty much on an hourly basis at this point. Anything else you want to add about any of this before I let you go? Well, well, Josh, this is a, a tragic event, but it, but it's also, you know, in the context of what we do at the university, it's a great study for us. And we use this reality and real world and the chaos of the real world for our students. Today is a big day for Coastal Carolina. We're having our annual Intelligence Day. We bring guests from all over the country in there, guest speakers. We have our students make presentations. And based on what you and I have talked about over the last almost six months, our students are gonna be presenting those findings, but focused on analysis. So this is a way for us today to demonstrate that. I just wanna give that 
a shout out real quick on that. Thank you. No, for sure. I appreciate that. Well, thank you again for always taking the time to, to be here with us. Josh, you're quite welcome. Anything I can do to help, I, you know, I'm always here for you. Thank you. Have a good rest of your day. You too, Josh. Thank you. And I do want to take you back to this post here from Israel on X or Twitter, depending what you call it, as we do continue to follow this breaking news out of the Middle East. Israel saying that troops have recovered the body of a hostage who was murdered in captivity by Islamic Jihad. The IDF identifying the hostage killed as 47-year-old Elad Katzer and posting this photo of the man who is from Kibbutz Naraz, and his body was retrieved by Israeli troops in Gaza's Han Yunus. Katzer and his mother were kidnapped back on October 7th, the IDF says, and his father was murdered that day. Katzer's mother released from captivity back in November. Again, more than 100 people still remain held hostage there in captivity since October 7th.